So how is everybody doing tonight? Good. Um, I just realized that tomorrow's the Super Bowl. And um, I realized that uh, the end of the Super Bowl is probably going to conflict with the beginning of our meeting. And I want you to know that we didn't uh, purposely schedule the meeting during the same time as the Super Bowl, but we also didn't go out of our way to make sure it didn't conflict with the Super Bowl. Um, and I just want, and if you're debating what to do tomorrow night, I just want to give you a couple things to think about. There was uh, once a girl that went to a football game with her boyfriend. She'd never seen football before. She didn't know how the game was played. And at the end of the game, he said, so dear, what did you think of the game? She said, well, it was interesting seeing all those young men in such, with such strong muscles playing on the field. And she said, but, um, but I never figured out um, why they were fighting over 25 cents. <laughs> he goes, what do you mean? She said, well, in the beginning of the game, um, the referee flipped the coin a quarter. One team won, the other team lost. And then all I heard the rest of the game was, get the quarterback, get the quarterback. <laughs> I used to live and die by Denver Bronco football. I grew up in Denver. It was like a religion in my family. And, um, you know, but I, I, I got to tell you, our topic tonight, tomorrow night is the second coming of Jesus, the, the Revelation's glorious rapture. And, you know, when Jesus bursts through the clouds of glory, no one's going to say who won the last Super Bowl, what is the record of the teams right now. That's not ever going to matter again. Isn't that true? So I want to challenge you to prioritize what's eternal over what's temporal. And so I want to encourage you to come to the meeting tomorrow night at 630. Um, our topic tonight is God's great judgment. Will you bow your heads with me? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we know that we are living in serious times and we know that the events of this world are wrapping up quickly. Last night we learned that since 1844 we're living in the time of the end. And so, Lord, I pray that we would truly live like you're coming soon. That you're coming and being part of heaven drives our lives, every aspect of it. And so, Lord, tonight as we look at the judgment, I pray that you would impress our hearts with the seriousness of this topic, but also the hope that we can find in the judgment as we will learn tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So as the story goes, there was once a man who bought 24 very expensive cigars, $1,000 a piece. And um, he actually took out an insurance policy for the cigars which included loss for theft, damage, or fire. And then he actually filed a claim saying that the 24 cigars had been, had been destroyed in a series of small fires. The insurance company denied the claim. So you know what he did? He sued. And he won, amazingly. He won the lawsuit. Does it ever seem like justice goes awry? Yeah. The, the guilty go free and the innocent are convicted? Yeah. Well, you know what? That is not the end of the story. Because the insurance company actually filed a complaint with the police. And they filed 24 counts of arson. <laughs> and the man was actually convicted of arson, fined $24,000, and sentenced to 24 months in jail. So it was justice served at the end of the day. Now, in my experience of 15 years in the justice system, I find that the justice system normally works. If it didn't work, if I saw injustice left and right, I would not have stayed in it. However, we definitely do hear about times where there is injustices. And of course, the media loves to report all the injustices when a case goes wrong, and maybe they should. But, you know, we all have a case pending before the heavenly court, a court that's actually fair. Now, when you hear the word judgment, what comes to your mind? Is that a word that, you, that is musical to your ears, like the word Jesus or love? 
Or does, some of you, or does the word judgment sometimes put fear in your heart? How many of you relish the idea of going to court? I used to love to go to court, but I wasn't the one that was facing jail time. What does the word judgment mean anyway? Judgment, if you just look it up in a dictionary, it means a decision for or against. In fact, when, we, when I used to um, participate in picking a jury on a case, we would tell them that, you know, I would tell them, you know, the, the judge is the one wearing the black robe. He's like the umpire. But you will actually be the judges of the case. You will ultimately decide if the defendant is guilty or not. And so, really, it's about making a decision. That's what the judgment's about, is making decisions for or against. Another definition, secular definition, of judgment is to separate the pure from the impure. And I think that definitely has a spiritual application, don't you? Separating the pure from the impure. Separating the true from the counterfeit. And in the Greek, the word for judgment is the word krisis. Now, what does that word sound like? Crisis. It's a time of great crisis. Now, what does the word crisis mean? Again, a secular definition. Crisis is the turning point in the course of a disease when it becomes clear whether the patient will live or die. I think that has a spiritual meaning application too, don't you? A time of great danger or trouble whose outcome decides whether possible bad consequences will follow. A decisive or crucial time or event. Now, is the crisis always a bad thing? Why not? How can it be a good thing? Isaac? How can that be a good thing? Okay, that's, I've never heard that one. That's a good one. It made Hawaii big, huh? Okay, it grows. Okay, sure. You know, it, my understanding of the Chinese is they actually have two characters for the word crisis. Danger, but also opportunity. So, you know, a crisis can actually be a time where people make changes in their life for the good. Isn't that right? Perhaps there's someone in your life that you've been praying for that they would come to Christ. And perhaps you've even prayed, Lord, do whatever it takes to get their attention, to bring them to the foot of the cross. Amen? Sometimes it takes a crisis to get people off their uh, you know, business as usual. And so crisis can actually be an opportunity for change. I know I have a friend that I went to college with, and for years... He didn't seem to have any interest in God, even though he'd grown up knowing about God and being taught of him. But you know, it was when he had cancer and he started really evaluating what's really important in life that he actually accept, re-accepted Christ and gave his heart back to him. So let's talk about the judgment, a time of crisis, a time that should get everybody's serious attention. During the judgment, who must appear in God's heavenly court? Let's take a look at what the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5, 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Who must appear in the heavenly court? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Notice what the Bible says. It says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So who all must appear in this courtroom? Every one of us, right? Now, do we appear there in person? Actually, during the phase of the judgment we'll be talking about tonight, we're there in abstentia. Okay? Sometimes a trial is held without the presence, physical presence of the defendant, as we'll soon see. But everyone must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So this is a case that all is affecting all of us. Romans 14, 12 confirms this as well. Uh, Romans chapter 14, verse 12. The 
the Bible says, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. That word account is something I used to love to use as a prosecutor, especially in my closing arguments. I tell the jury, now who can I pick on tonight? Pascal, can I pick on you? No? You don't want me to pick on you? Who should I pick on? Jeremiah, okay. Is he a good friend, or are you throwing him under the bus right now? Okay. Jeremiah, can I pick on you? Martin, can I pick on you? Okay, good. We have a good volunteer. I hesitate on who I choose because I've picked on people before, and then I never saw them again. Martin, you're going to come back no matter what tomorrow, right? Okay, good. So let's, let's say Martin's on trial, and I say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you need to hold Martin accountable for what he's done. Okay, that was a, that's a word that prosecutors love. Hold him accountable. Will we be held accountable for how we live our life in this earth? Because sometimes we act like there's no judge up there, no God, right? We can do what we want. But we will be held accountable according to the Bible. Now, it's human nature to blame others for our mistakes. Isn't that right? In fact, Time Magazine had a cover story that says, infidelity, it may be in our genes. So if you are not faithful to your spouse, it's not your fault. It's just part of who you are. It's, you can blame your parents, right? Remember that famous saying by Flip Wilson? The devil made me do it. So it's not my fault. Now, is that really true? Can the devil make you do anything? No. He can severely test you, try you, but ultimately you have free choice. Isn't that right? No one can force you to do anything. And so we've, ever since the Garden of Eden, we've been blaming others for our mistakes. So Adam blamed Eve, and Eve blamed the serpent, and he didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> we've been doing it ever since. So when does the judgment begin? We learned the answer to that question last night, didn't we? 1844. But let's, I want to share with you, that's the only verse I know of that actually gives us the exact date. But I want to show you the consistency of Scripture on this. Let's turn to a couple of verses in Acts to see that the judgment begins not at the cross, but later. Past, uh, so in the, in, the, in the years of the early church, it was still future tense, okay? which is consistent with what we learned last night. But let's just take a look at a couple of verses on this. Acts 17, 31. Acts chapter 17, verse 31. The Bible says, Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world. Notice what tense is that? He will what? He will. Future tense. He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereat he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Another verse that shows the, the judgment would be in the future during the days of the early church is Acts 24, 25. Acts chapter 24, 25. Here you have Paul speaking before Felix, a leader in the Roman government. Notice the effect that Paul had on Felix. And as he reasoned of righteousness, What's righteousness about? What's the root word for righteousness? Right. right. What's right? What's wrong, right? He reasoned of him of righteousness, temperance, temperance. You know, this is during the time when the Romans were known to be a lascivious people, and they loved to feast so much sometimes that they actually had something in the back called a vomitorium where a, feather would, uh, a servant would tickle them on the throat with a feather so that they could continue feasting even when their tummy was full. I don't think I need to give any more explanation, right? All right. <laughs> and so this is the time that Paul is speaking to Felix. And judgment to come. So judgment is when? Future tense, past, or present? At that time, it was future tense. Notice the effect that it had on Felix. He trembled, which means he was under deep conviction. 
by what Paul was sharing with him and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. You know, one of the, you know, you know, one of the devil's greatest tactics is delay. You know, Felix was convinced by what he heard. The problem is he wasn't prepared to act upon it. Isn't that right? He said, come back later when it's more convenient. Besides the devil being really good at delay, another thing that he's really good about is making sure that a convenient time never comes. So when we learn new spiritual truths like Felix did, what should we do? Should we be one of those people that Winston Churchill describes? Most people sometime in their lives stumble across truth. Most jump up, brush themselves off, and hurry on about their business as if nothing had happened. Can we do, afford to do that in spiritual matters? No, we should act upon it when we learn truths from, from God's word. So when is the judgment? Last night we learned that the judgment comes after the period of the little, or actually we learned this previously, we talked about also last night. The judgment comes sequentially after Rome is divided into 10 kingdoms and then the little horn comes and reigns for 1260 years. So the judgment is the next important prophetic event on the timeline after 1798. So it's sometime not too long after 1798. Daniel 8 also told us this by talking about the cleansing of the sanctuary, which is synonymous with the final judgment beginning after the little horn after 1798. And of course, last night we were able to pin it down to an exact year along the prophetic timeline given to us by Daniel 8 and 9 being 1844. Did, was Jesus baptized right on time? Yes, he was. Was he crucified right on time? Yes. Same thing with the judgment beginning right on time in 1844. You know what's really interesting is to see what was happening spiritually in the world at that same time. Now, I believe God used a man named William Miller in 1844 and in the years leading up to that date. William Miller was a farmer who actually was converted at the age of 34. He became a follower of Jesus and he loved to study the Word of God. Back then, what he had was a Bible, a Cruden's Concordance, and he always asked for the Holy Spirit to be with him when he studied the Bible. And he would move systematically through the Bible and only going as far as he had light and understanding. He got really excited as he began to study the book of Daniel. And eventually he realized what we learned last night, that in 1843 and then eventually 1844, that the cleansing of the sanctuary was to take place. And in fact, eventually settled upon the date of October 22nd, 1844, because that's the Day of Atonement in 1844. Now, there were lots of people who actually heard this man preach about this. He started off just wanting to be a farmer, but as he studied these truths, the Lord whispered to him, tell it to the world. Well, he didn't want to tell it to the world. He's like, I'm not a preacher. Finally, he got tired of the Holy Spirit coming to him with that message. So he finally said, okay, God, if you want me to share this message, you're going to have to invite me to preach about what I've been studying. He thought he was safe because he'd never been asked to preach before. After he made that deal with God, about 20 minutes later, he got a knock at his door. It was his nephew, Irving. Irvin. He said, Uncle William, Father told me to come here on horseback and invite you to preach tomorrow. And he had left an hour and a half before. Amazing how God works. And Uncle William said, what do you want me to preach about? He said, whatever you've been studying. And he said, oh, why did I make it so easy for God? And he went into that maple grove saying, God, choose someone else. But he came out a preacher. He went in a farmer and came out a preacher. So he began to share this message. The only problem with William Miller and his message was that he had a misunderstanding about the cleansing of the sanctuary. He assumed that the cleansing of the sanctuary was the cleansing of the earth at the second coming of Jesus. 
So he believed that Jesus was actually coming in 1844. And a number of people that followed his teachings were expecting Jesus to come on October 22, 1844. Did Jesus come back that day? No. And those people suffered a great disappointment. However, I believe that God used the Millerite movement to direct attention to the book of Daniel and to see that even though Jesus wasn't coming yet, very important events were now beginning to unfold as the final chapter of earth's history. Does that mean William Miller was a false prophet? And that anything that came out of the Millerite movement should be disregarded? If you say yes to that question, then I would challenge you with this. Were the disciples false prophets? Because when Jesus died on the cross, they believed he was a phony. They no longer you know, were as optimistic about his ministry as they'd been. In fact, they suffered a great disappointment. Every time Christ does something important connected to the sanctuary, his followers at first misunderstand, they suffer a great disappointment. But once they receive more truth, he turns their great disappointment into a great appointment. He did it when he died. That happened when Jesus died. Because remember, when Jesus died on the cross, that was the, <clears throat> that was the part of the sanctuary dealing with the altar of sacrifice. Jesus on the cross, that's that part of the sanctuary. But what he's doing now, since 1844, is ministering in the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. All these things are connected to the sanctuary, which is all about Jesus. Well, <clears throat> there were people that, after the great disappointment, most people that followed William Miller lost hope and faith. But some of the Millerites continued to study their Bibles and said, you know, we know the date's correct, but they started re-examining what's the real event. And they started realizing the cleansing of the sanctuary had to do with the heavenly sanctuary that Hebrews 8 and 9 talks about. Well, you know, at the same time, God was raising up people that were expecting his return. The devil was very busy at work. Does anybody know who this is? That's Karl Marx, that's right. In 1844, he stated that religion, religion is the opiate of the masses. During, and that year, he formed a friendship with Frederick Engels, and together these two men came up with a theory of government known as socialism that eventually resulted in communism. Now, has communism been a friend to Christianity? No, it denies Christianity. It's turned many people away from a loving creator God. Which brings me to this next man, who's this? This is Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin actually completed his manuscript in 1844 on a book called the, On the Origin of Species. That's what it's known by today, but the full title is On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. And you know, Adolf Hitler merely carried out this theory by saying that one race is superior to others and so it should do dominate. And Charles Darwin is known as the father of evolution and has that, has that been an enemy of Christianity? Yes, because it says that we have no creator. Another man that something significant happened to in 1844 was this man here. Anybody know who this is? I heard someone over here whisper it. Joseph Smith, that's right. Did you know, do you know he was actually assassinated in 1844? And of course, Joseph Smith was the founder of the Mormon faith. I visited Carthage, Illinois, where he actually uh, jumped out of this second story window. It was actually a jail. And there was a mob that was coming to take retribution on Joseph Smith. And uh, to escape the crowd, he started to jump out the second story window. And as he did so, they actually shot him. So they don't know if he died from the, the, the gunshot or hitting the ground. But these two things together, you know, he, he ended up dying. Now, I've worked with some very 
wonderful Mormon lawyers and judges. And uh, so there's, there's many fine Mormon people. Maybe some of you have some friends that are Mormon. This isn't to disparage any particular person or group. But I, I, I must say, I have looked into the Book of Mormon, which purports to be a history of North America. At the same time, the Bible is a history of the Middle East. And um, like I said to a lady that was encouraging me to read the Book of Mormon when I went to this jail, a, a Mormon missionary, I said, you know, I have a question for you. I said, you know, I've been to the Middle East. I've been to the Holy Land. You can still go to Bethlehem and Jerusalem and Beersheba and Hebron and Jericho. I've been to all those places. The Dead Sea, the Red Sea, the Jordan River, and the list goes on. I said, where is there any archaeological evidence in America that backs up the Book of Mormon? Because it describes all these um, magnificent civilizations and architecture and battles and all these things. You know what she said? I don't know. <laughs> she actually got an older Mormon missionary to come speak to me. And I asked him the same question and he said, you just have to believe. You just have to believe. With, not based on any evidence. One of the things I appreciate about God is he wants to reach us at the heart. He also wants to reach us in the head. He's a very logical God who, present, who, who gives us evidence to believe. Can you say amen to that? And so if you have questions about the Book of Mormon, there's a really good video you could just put on YouTube. and just, it's, um, You can just Google and put the Book of Mormon versus the Bible. It's a very interesting documentary actually comparing uh, those two books. Another thing that happened in 1844 or thereabout was this man named John Nelson Darby, who's the father of dispensationalism. He actually came up with the theory of the secret rapture. And um, he maintains he got his doctrine from the Bible alone. However, his insistence on the secret rapture was new even to himself until about 1843 or 1845. That's according to him. I, why he left out 1844, I'm not sure. About the same time. This man, Andrew Jackson Davis, is known as the John, John the Baptist of modern spiritualism. He had his first trance in 1844. Same thing with the founder of the Baha'i faith. He had his first vision in 1844. So while God was hoping the world would focus on the judgment and the final work of Christ, the devil was very busy distracting people with lots of different movements. So let's talk more about this judgment that began in 1844. What can we learn about the judgment when we look at what takes place in human courtrooms? Specifically, what are the three phases of trial in a court of law? Well, the first phase we call the investigation phase. After a jury is picked or eliminated, you know, we used to call it jury selection, but really it was about jury elimination. Because <laughs> both sides say, please excuse juror number five, please, please excuse juror number 10, and then whoever you have left, that's your jury. So you don't actually say, I want him. You just say, I don't want her. Very interesting. How many of you have ever served on a jury, by the way? Wow, quite a few of you. So, you know, Oregon has something unique when it comes to criminal law. I don't know if any other state does this. What's unique uh, in terms of verdicts in, the, in Oregon? doesn't have to be unanimous. In most other states, including California, for someone to be convicted or acquitted in a criminal case, the verdict has to be unanimous. In Oregon, I think it's 10 to 2. So it's a lot easier for prosecutors to actually convict someone in Oregon. <laughs> so after you pick a jury, choose a jury, or you have a jury, and the judge gives uh, initial instructions, and the lawyers give opening statements, and the jury is told, hey, the opening statement is not evidence. Okay? Then you begin with presenting evidence. Most of it comes through witnesses, some physical evidence. This is what we call the investigation phase. It's, where it's the fact-finding 
phase. It's where jurors get to consider evidence that they will later determine is this evidence factual or not? Because there is a difference between evidence and facts, right? Some evidence is false evidence or unimportant evidence. Does the Bible also have an investigation phase in the trial? The, one, the trial that really counts. Daniel 7, 9 and 10. Daniel chapter 7. And you'll remember, as we studied through the book of da uh, Daniel 7, in the chapter of Daniel 7, we looked at these four beasts. And we kept, after we kept looking at the fourth beast, Rome, we kept noticing it. Would, the, the Bible would then go back, would go to a judgment scene. Here's one of those instances. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. That's a large courtroom. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. Now, why do you open a book? To study, right? And so, books are being examined here. You know, Satan has challenged God as being unfair and unjust. But these books help reveal that God has done everything he can to save every person. So God's also on judgment, uh, on trial, on this judgment. So after a jury hears all the evidence, and the evidence is closed to them, then the judge will give final instructions. He'll give them, he'll instruct the jury on the law. The attorneys will get a chance to give closing arguments. And then what does the jury do? They go to lunch. <laughs> and then eventually they deliberate, right? And what does the judge ask them to do if they are, if at all possible? To reach a, a verdict, which is really making a decision. That's the second phase of the trial. Reaching a verdict, a decision. And so, does the same thing happen in the heavenly courtroom? Revelation 22, 11. Notice the verdict. Revelation 22, 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. And really the verdict in the courtroom is merely affirming the decisions we ourselves have made. Now, is this verdict final? Or is there still time to repent of our sins and to give our heart to Jesus? When this verdict comes out, it is final. If you have a filthy heart, if you have refused to let God work in your life, that's the way you will remain. However, if you have allowed God to do a work, to create, to do a work of righteousness in your life, that will, that's what will remain. What a contrast between the final verdict at the end versus what we're told in Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. We serve a very patient God, don't we? But even a patient God eventually has to close probation, doesn't he? Our probationary period is not forever. Our ability to say yes to Christ is not forever. And by the way, I forgot to mention this, but does the Bible ever record that for Felix there was a convenient time? The Bible never mentions that he gave his heart to Christ and that the, that deep conviction he, he experienced that he acted upon it. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7, while there's still time, notice what the Lord says to us. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. 
and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. We serve a God that wants to pardon us, that wants to accept us. But ultimately, it's up to us. But do you notice the contrast between Isaiah 55 and Revelation 22? Isaiah 55 still gives a hope of time, right? Whereas Revelation says, when it's too late, it's too late. At some point, verdicts become final. When do they become final in a hum human courtroom? When is the magic moment when a verdict is final? Now, there are some, you know, once in a great while, someone that is convicted, for instance, can win on appeal. They say that losing at trial is your first step toward a successful appeal. Did you get that? Okay. So, but very rarely does a conviction get overturned on appeal. You have to prove that the law was not followed, the judge gave incorrect instructions, or the jury engaged in misconduct or something like that, but it's very rare, very rare. Normally the appellate court affirms the trial court's conviction. <clears throat> so with that exception, when does a verdict become final truly? When's the magic moment, do you know? <clears throat> Someone said when the sentence is carried out. Now in California, you have a right to four weeks, unless you waive that right, between the verdict and the sentencing. Four weeks, that's a month. Does that mean the jury has a month to change their mind? When does the verdict become final? When it's read? Okay. You know, I did a case called the people of the state of California versus Robbie Brown. Robbie Brown actually went to a tire store and bought a bunch of nice tires and rims, spent about $5,000 just on tires and rims. It's amazing how much money you'll spend when it's not yours. And he used false credit, never intending to really pay for it. So we prosecuted Robbie Brown for fraud. It was a very hard fought trial against a very good defense lawyer. The jury was out for a long time. And then finally I get the phone call, like it used to be in the days for expectant fathers. Got that phone call, the jury has a verdict. And so, you know, be here at such and such a time back in the courtroom when, after the clerk calls. And, of course, it's very, uh, you get very nervous when that verdict's read. And the judge will take the verdict from the jury foreperson, look it over, make sure it looks okay, and then typically hand it to the clerk. Madam Clerk, read the verdict. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Robbie Darnell Brown, guilty of fraud. And they found him guilty. And so then, <clears throat> after he was found guilty, um, the judge asked the lawyers, D would you like me to pull the jury? And if you're on the winning side, you don't want to pull the jury. But if you're on the losing side, yes, Your Honor, please. And so the defense attorney said, yes, Your Honor. And so then the judge says, juror number one, is this your verdict? Yes. Juror number two, is this your verdict? Yes. Okay. And where did our defendant go, by the way? Where's it? No, Martin. He's my, he's the guy, he's my defendant for the whole night, okay? The whole night. Is he, is he going in and out? Are young people going in and out of the meeting? Maybe you need to stay put. Where did he go? Maybe he got, already got hauled off to jail. I don't know. All right. Tell him he was missed. So, where was I? <laughs> Pulling the jury, okay? And then, after every juror says, that is our verdict, the judge says this, Madam Clerk, record the verdict. She takes her stamp and goes, shh, shh, with the date and time. That is the magic moment. Well, after that took place, the judge dismissed the jury, said the gag order, you can't talk to the lawyers or anybody else about the case, has been removed. And it's always interesting to talk to jurors afterwards. <laughs> Welcome back, Martin. Where were you when I needed you? Okay. 
So, um, <clears throat> so uh, and you know, it's, you realize, wow, this is scary how juries make decisions. But normally, in my experience, they make the right decision, but how they got there is always kind of strange. Anyway, I was talking to the jury, and then the defense attorney, she got all excited. She says, David, David, we got to go back and talk to the judge. I said, why? She goes, one of the jurors wants to change her mind. I'm like, oh, great. We went back in there, and we talked to the judge. She said, judge, judge, we need to undo the verdict. I said, not so fast. We need to brief this. Let's, let's set it for a hearing date. And... Um, so I was doing my research to respond to her motion. She, got, she f had the juror fill out a declaration. Actually, she probably filled out the declaration, had the juror sign it, saying, I really didn't want to vote guilty. I felt kind of pressured and all this. Really, I didn't want to, and I did. Well, you can't really go into the minds of the jurors on what they were thinking. Now, if there was misconduct, that's one thing. But there is always pressure when there's persuasion, you know? Um, one of my professors in college said persuasion just means good advice given in advance. So anyway, I was researching this and there was a appellate decision, uh, a written opinion that had been published of a murder case in Los Angeles where there had been a, the, the judge had pulled the jury and then they had recorded the verdict before they'd even dismissed the jury from the jury box, a juror jumped up and said, Your Honor, I want to change my mind. And the judge said, Sorry, it's too late. And on appeal, the appellate court upheld that conviction and said, No, once that verdict is recorded, it is final. There has to be some point where there's finality, even in a human courtroom. And the same thing's true when it comes to the heavenly courtroom. There ultimately is a final verdict. But I'm thankful that the fact finder doesn't make any mistakes. Now, after a, someone is convicted in a human courtroom, what is the final phase that my friend David mentioned earlier? The sentencing, right? Where they determine the actual punishment. Revelation 22.12 tells us this. Revelation 22, 12. And behold, I come quickly. Who is speaking here? Jesus. He's coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Now, doesn't it make sense that the final verdict that the judgment with the verdict would take place by the time Jesus comes. A lot of people think the judgment is after Christ comes, but when Jesus comes, he has his reward with him. He knows who he's taking with him because the decision of separating the sheep from the goats, the wheat from the tares, has already taken place. And that makes sense as we're studying the Bible, seeing that that begins began in 1844, that process. So now what are these books that are open in the judgment? Revelation 20, verse 12. The Bible says, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. How many of you have, has, have a desire to author a book in your, while you're here on earth? Maybe... Maybe, has there, is there anybody who, who has actually written a book? Okay. I can only take credit for writing like one chapter in, in a book that Amazing Facts put out. But uh, if there's only one book I could be, where my name could be written, it would be the book of life. How about you? And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And so there is a book of life. And there are also books that we are judged out of. Malachi 3.16 mentions a book. Malachi 3.16. This is called a book of remembrance. This is a good book. Malachi 3.16 tells us, Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord 
hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. So this is a book of remembrance of those that have given their life to Christ. Do you think there's a book of iniquity? Jeremiah 2.22. Is it possible to sin in the dark and where God doesn't notice? God sees all, doesn't he? You want to talk about an all-seeing eye, it's God. Jeremiah 2.22. For though thou wash thee with nitre and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord God. There is a book of iniquity. Isaiah 65, 6 and 7. Isaiah 65, 6 and 7. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silence, but will recompense, even recompense into their bosom. Your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore, will I measure their former work into their bosom. So there is a book of iniquities. Now, what do these books demonstrate that the judgment actually takes into account? What does God consider in the judgment? Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. Notice what the wise man Solomon says. What does Solomon say? By the way, you know my name's David, and we're trying to come up with a name, maybe even a Bible name for our son. What do you think about me naming him Solomon? How many think that's a good idea? How many think that's not a good idea? A lot more hands say no. Why? Because he had some issues, <laughs> don't we all? Solomon, um, he really screwed up, didn't he? And um, he lived a very unfaithful life for most of his adult years. But at least he came back to the Lord at the end. But think of how much damage he must have done with his negative influence. Like they say in Micronesia, Solomon, he had plenty wives, teacher, plenty wives. <laughs> Okay, and they drove him away from the Lord. You know what I'm talking about, right? Dwayne and Colleen and Kenton in Micronesia. Plenty wives, teacher, plenty wives. You've never heard them talk like that? Okay. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So according to Solomon, are our works considered in the judgment, our actions? Sure they are. Don't our actions reveal where our heart is? Jesus confirms this in Matthew 7. Matthew 7, 21 through 23 And these are very sad words I hope that no one in this room ever hears. Jesus says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now wait a minute. Is this talking about atheists? Or complete infidels? This is talking about people that call on, on him as Lord, right? So these are professed believers. But he says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth, there's that word do, or you could say works, the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And so, yes, our works are considered in the judgment. But not only that, what, did, what else did Jesus say is considered in the judgment besides our works? Matthew 12, 36 and 37. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So you mean even our words are considered in the judgment? That's right. How many words do you speak a week? 
Supposedly, the average person speaks enough words in one week to fill a book of 320 pages. Some of you, I must say, have bigger books. <laughs> and some of you have much smaller books. Who do you think makes bigger books, men or women? <laughs> Children do? Yeah. You know, I haven't, I haven't been able to come up with the answer to that question. We all know men that talk a lot and women that don't talk much and everything in between. But we all are filling books with words. Imagine in the course of a lifetime the library of books that we are filling. Words are powerful, aren't they? That's why the wise men said in Proverbs 18.21 that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Think of some words you've heard in your lifetime that were maybe very powerful. What about the first time you really that someone you really loved told you, I love you? Were those powerful words? What about that call in the middle of the night? Dad, it's about the car. Or when the, when the uh, doctor says, congratulations, it's a girl. When you were expecting a boy. No, I don't know. Maybe that'll happen. I don't know. But, or what about, you're so stupid. If you hear that enough, you probably will start believing it. Words are very powerful. And um, do you think this includes gossip? What kind of book, what kind of information are you filling in your books? Words of encouragement? Words of truth? Or gossip and slander? Do you think that you would gossip as much if you knew that the words that you speak will one day be known by all? Even the person you're talking about? Might cause you to gossip less, right? Hopefully none, none at all. I know for me, when I mention this, it's very convicting. It's easy to forget that. What else is considered in the judgment? 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. How many times have we been guilty of using prayer as a, as, a, as a way to dodge gossip? Like, we need to pray for someone, and then it's an excuse to just gossip away, right? 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. Counsels of the hearts means that even our motives, what's going on in the heart will be judged. Is it possible to do the right thing for the wrong reason? Sure it is. And left to ourselves, we, we all have wicked hearts, don't we? Isn't that what Jeremiah said? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That's why David, the psalmist, said, Lord, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Does God have the power to clean our hearts? Yes, he does, if we'll surrender to him. Now, is there a standard that we're judged by in the judgment? Is there a standard in a court of law on this earth? What standard do they use in Oregon? On a criminal case in California, you use the penal code, which states what the law is. You can't just say someone's, you can't say, Mart, I want to take, you know, if I'm a DA, I can't say I want Martin put in jail because he's just a bad guy. You can't do that, right? You have to say Martin on such and such a date broke this particular law, right? What about the heavenly courtroom? Is there a standard by which we're judged? Let's take a look at James 2, 11 and 12. James chapter 2, 11 and 12. Notice this. James chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, page 1201 of the Seminar Bible. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. Now, what law is this speaking of? Ten Commandments. Verse 12 says, So speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by what? The law of liberty. And I love 
how James describes it as a law of liberty. The devil has convinced so many people that God's law is restrictive. It's going to take away your fun, your freedom. But James says, no, it's the law of freedom. It's the law of liberty. So we're judged by the Ten Commandments. Now, is there a prosecuting attorney in the heavenly courtroom? Revelation 12, 9 and 10 tells us who it is. Perhaps you were someone that was raised in a church where you were kind of taught that God is just can't wait to, to give it to you. Like he's the prosecutor. Is, is God the prosecutor? Revelation 12, 9 and 10. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So who's the prosecuting attorney? It's the devil himself. Now, I have to admit, one time as, when I was a prosecutor, I was compared to the devil himself <laughs> by a judge. That's right. Woo! <laughs> what happened was I was fairly new in Sacramento. Um, I had transferred from Riverside to Sacramento County. And um, one day we were picking a jury on a case where the defense attorney was excited because the judge kept, made all these evidentiary rulings which really kept out a lot of evidence that I was planning on using about a guy's priors. It seemed like whenever this guy got arrested, he would hide rock cocaine from the police. And I wanted to show a pattern of that conduct. But anyway, um, the judge kept it all out. And he, he thought I wasn't being reasonable on my ability to... to um, plea bargain the case, so he was, I think he was kind of punishing me. But anyway, um, when we broke for lunch while we were selecting a jury after the defense had all these favorable rulings, as, as the jury was filing out, I noticed that the, the senior pastor of the church that I had just started attending was there. And I said, Pastor Osborne, what are you doing here? He said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm trying this case. I said, what are you doing here? He said, well, did you know that the judge actually is a member of our church? I said, I didn't know that. And uh, he says, yeah, I have lunch with him once a month. Okay, interesting. So then we come back from lunch, and the judge makes an announcement outside the presence of the jury to the defense. And to me, he said, uh, I just found out Mr. Stewart goes to the same church I do. Now, it's a big church, so I didn't know he went there. But he said, um, I'm willing to recuse myself off the case. And the defense is all, no, 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 we'll waive any conflict. We're, we're happy with you and your rulings. And I waived a conflict too. And then he says, well, Mr. Defendant, I want you to know that if I see Mr. Stewart this weekend in church, I will flee from him like he's the devil himself. <laughs> now, who's the defense attorney in the heavenly courtroom? 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. First John 2, 1 John 2.1, my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Amen. So who's the advocate? Jesus. Jesus. You know, I've gone up against some pretty good Jewish lawyers, but never, none like as good as this Jewish lawyer, and he's never lost a case. Hebrews 7.25 to confirm who our defense attorney is. Hebrews 7.25 Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So Jesus is not only our advocate, but he actually makes intercession for us during the judgment. Now, Matthew 10, 32, Jesus is speaking here. 
And notice that Jesus doesn't represent everybody. You know, once in a while in court, we would have a defendant that represented himself. We call them improper. What did Abraham Lincoln say about a man that represents himself? He has a fool for a client. But you know, you can represent yourself in the judgment if you want to. Jesus doesn't force his services on anybody. In Mark 10.32, the Bible says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. He only represents us if we truly have given ourselves to him and confess him to others. So we know who the defendant is. It's us. We know who the defense attorney is. It's Jesus. And we know the prosecutor is the devil. Well, who's the judge? God who? God the Father. I'm hearing Jesus, God the Father. Who is it? Let's take a look at John 5.22. Oh, this is such good news. John 5, 22. The Bible says, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. I'd be happy with the Father judging me too, because they're of one mind, right? Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father is just as fair and as loving and merciful as Jesus is. But imagine this. The same person defending you is your judge. That's really good news, isn't it? How can you lose? Imagine you go to court and you're like, man, my lawyer's always late. Where is he? And you're like, he's nowhere to be found. Then you look up and he's wearing a black robe. And you're like, yes. Acts 17.31, which we saw earlier, but now we're going to look at a new light. Is Jesus really the judge? Acts 17.31. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. So that's Jesus, right? When does God announce the final verdict? We already read in Revelation 22, 11 and 12, it's when he comes. Behold, I come quickly, my reward is with me. And last night we learned that given the serious times in which we live, what is our job when it comes to our life of sin? What does Acts 3.19 tell us to do? To repent. Repent ye therefore. Repent ye therefore and be converted. That your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. We all want our sins blotted out, don't we? It's really as simple as saying, Jesus, I want to repent of my sins. I don't want to do this anymore. Change me. Here's a very important question I want to give you tonight, and that is, do you have the assurance that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Does Jesus want you to have that assurance? What did John say in 1 John 4? 1 John 4, 15 through 18. 1 John 4, 15 through 18. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. It's really about loving God, isn't it? Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. We need to have assurance and boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. We need a lot more of the love of Jesus in our hearts, don't we? The love of Jesus casts out fear and gives us boldness in the day of judgment. I love how Je Daniel chapter 7, verse 21 and 22 
tells us this about the judgment. It says, I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favor of who? In favor of the saints, of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. And so Jesus is so anxious to find in our favor in the judgment. One day there was a store owner who tacked a for sale sign on his store that said puppies for sale. And you know, signs like that have a way of attracting children. And pretty soon a little boy appeared under the store owner's sign. How much are you going to sell the puppies for? The little boy asked. The store owner said, oh, somewhere between 30 and $50, depending on the dog. The little boy reached into his pocket. He pulled out $2.37. And he says, may I look at them? And so the store owner whistled and said, lady, come out here. And a female, the mother came out, followed by five little fur balls. And the little boy noticed that the one in the back was kind of lagging behind the others and limping. And he said, what's wrong with that puppy? And the owner said, well, actually, I took him to the veterinarian and found out that he's missing a hip socket. So he'll always limp. He'll always be lame. And the boy said, well, how much do you want for him? And the store owner said, you don't want that puppy. He can't play and run like the other puppies can. Why would you want him? And the little boy looked him in the eye. And he says, and if you want him, you can just have him for free. And the little boy looked at that man in the eye. He said, that puppy's worth just as much as the others. He says, can I give you the money for him now? and pay you 50 cents a month, I'll make payments. And the owner said, sure, but why do you want him? He can't play, you can't have fun with him like the other puppies. And so then the boy lifted up his leg, his pant leg to reveal a badly crippled leg with a brace, a leg brace. And he said, that puppy's gonna need somebody that understands. You know, the Bible in Hebrews 2, 17 and 18, as we bring it to a close tonight, it tells us that one of the reasons why Jesus came as a man to this earth is because we need a high priest and a judge that understands. Hebrews 2, 17 and 18 says, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor, which means to help them that are tempted. How many of you tonight would like to accept Jesus as your lawyer to represent you in the judgment? to surrender yourself to him and give up the things that separate you from God. Amen? Let's pray together. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that the judgment would make a deep impression on us, not only tonight, but in the days to come. Lord, we are living in a time of crisis where you are separating the pure from the impure the saved from the lost, the sheep from the goats, the true Christians from the counterfeits, the phonies. Lord, help us to be true Christians, true followers of Jesus. Lord, help us where we fall short. Lord, we pray that you would engage in a work of sanctification in our life to prepare us for heaven. We thank you, Lord, that on the cross, that you gave us our title to heaven by declaring us not guilty. But Lord, we also need to be fit for heaven. And so Lord, I pray you would do a work in each of our lives and may we surrender to the moving of the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you everybody for coming. We'll be here at 6.30 again tomorrow night. Our topic is Revelation's Glorious Rapture. See you then.